Real Talk USA. Hello everyone, this is our weekly show, Real Talk USA on 105.3 Afro FM and it's me, Eol Salomon, with Chris Mead here. Hello Chris. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing good, a little bit cold. <laughs> we're, we're, both, we're both sick, aren't we? Uh, yes, <laughs> but, but we're I okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope we don't infect, we have a singer-songwriter and a teacher here today, so I hope that our colds don't... Uh, Infect her yeah. and ruin her ability Our fingers to sing. crossed. <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, today uh, we'd like to welcome Caroline Herring uh, to our show. Caroline, welcome to Real Talk USA. How are you today? I'm great. It's really fun to be on your show. Thanks for having me. Caroline, you are an internationally acclaimed American singer-songwriter and an English as a second language teacher. So that's a very unique combination. Can you tell us a little bit about how how that happened? Sure. Well, right after college in Mississippi, I started teaching high school for several years, and I taught history, I taught uh, English, literature, I, I taught French. And then after several years, uh, and going back for grad school, I morphed into becoming a singer-songwriter. I moved to the University of Texas in Austin and started playing there and did a um, a weekly happy hour and formed a great band and found a record label and became best new artist at the Austin Music Awards and promptly moved a few months later, got married uh, and moved to pretty soon to Atlanta and for the past 20 years or so I have made several albums and toured uh, throughout the US and Europe and had a lot of fun doing that. Uh, a few years ago I started wanting to pull back on my touring and my husband and I and our kids spent about half a year in Germany uh, on a Fulbright teaching exchange and I was taking um, immersive German every day and my kids were in German school and I was really loving it. And I loved how I had community from all over the world in my classes and I liked the language challenge. And it reminded me that I had taught English as a second language before in China many years previous and I just started thinking about refugee resettlement in the States and in Atlanta where I lived. And so when I returned, I went back to school and got a master's certificate in applied linguistics and have been teaching for the past several years women who are refugees in Clarkston, Georgia, which is the largest refugee resettlement in Georgia, and I love it. There are a lot of Ethiopian students in our classes, and I continue to play music, and I love it, and I'm working on projects, but it was fun for me to have a change. I needed, I was a little bored in what I was doing and needed a shift, something about serving others and not just thinking about myself all the time, which is what the music business is. And so, here I am, um, combining both of my careers and thrilled to be in Addis Ababa for the first time and um, teaching and singing in several locations. Yeah, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, what brings you to, as you mentioned before we went on, that this is your first trip to Africa. It is. And so can you tell us a little bit about what brings you here and what you're going to be doing? Yes. Well. I had been in discussion with people here at the U.S. Embassy and their public affairs office about coming. I think there's a long tradition of musicians and artists uh, visiting for uh, goodwill work in different countries all over the world. And I've known musicians who've done it before and I thought it sounded wonderful. And um, so I kept talking with them and getting more and more into my ESL teaching and the opportunity presented itself and so this week I am giving concerts and I am teaching workshops on songwriting but I am also teaching uh, at schools um, learning English through music I am working with a group of refugee students I am uh, going to a couple of refugee camps in western Ethiopia to work with musicians there so the experience is just extraordinary. I feel very privileged to be doing it. Very good. Well, I, I want to talk a little bit about your music and then I want to talk about your work with refugees. Okay. So uh, how would you describe your style of music? 
I am, my music is Americana folk. Uh, I started out uh, really based in classic country music, and I think when you listen to my music, you hear traditional music paired with modern lyrics. And so, and folk, you know, not so much music of the people, but that genre in the United States that is acoustic based and singer songwriter and uh, something that is not just based in a musical tradition. So that's where I fit, somewhere in there. So, I, I, you and I like both like country music. Yes, and, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> can you describe the difference between folk and country? I think you just hit on it a little bit. So, is folk more less produced, more more acoustic? Uh, how would you like? I'm sure. I know it's a continuum. Sure. Um, but how would how would you define the difference between folk and country? Well, to me, and I'm not even sure that today's country music represents it, but it is comes from a an established tradition with the Carter family and Jimmy Rogers recording in the 20s in Bristol, Virginia, and uh, music out of the mountains combined just a little bit with African American sounds that were formed in the mountains and then this huge, they called them hillbilly records and it moved into just this really great fiddle based, banjo based music uh, and people singing about hard times and their loved ones and death and really real great music. And today it is huge, it's a, an enormous business and we were talking about Chris Stapleton. He is one of the first country musicians in a while, I think, who sounds authentically country. And I love him. He's fantastic. He's been a national songwriter for years. And it's big business, country is. Yeah, sure. But uh, folk music, so at the Grammys, there's a contemporary folk category. So it's somewhere between country and pop. Uh, it's mostly music with a lot of words and um, pretty melodies, but not leaning too much into country music and not um, driving enough to be pop music. And I think more about uh, political movements, maybe Joan Baez and Pete Seeger and resistant mu uh, movements like that and you know the response to the Vietnam or when those singers all emerged and they began to love classic country and bluegrass and I think there's a folk tradition there and that's where that's what people think of but now it's just somewhere in there between country and pop. Got it. So uh, maybe it would uh, it's best illustrated by playing a song. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned a few songs which uh, Camila Camila? Camilla. Camilla. Yeah. Uh, is Camilla a pretty good uh, example of what folk music sounds like? Yes. It's a terrific example. So, And it's Lucinda Williams-esque. So it's got uh, electric guitars on it and good drums, and it's got a big sound. But Camilla is about Camilla, Georgia, during the Civil Rights Movement in the summer of 1962, and a woman named Marion King whose husband was head of the Albany, Georgia Civil Rights Movement. She goes to visit a friend in jail in Camilla and she's badly beaten and she miscarries and she survives and I just wanted to tell her story and recognize her. Okay, well, uh, we are about to uh, play Camilla. Yes. Hope you guys enjoy. This song is called Camilla and it's about a woman named Marion King who went to visit her friend's daughter in jail in Camilla, Georgia in 1962 during the Albany Civil Rights Movement. And uh, she was six months pregnant and had her three kids with her. And um, the deputy sheriff wasn't interested in visitors that day. Babies in that cast 
jailhouse in Camilla, Georgia to see a woman and ask her parole. Mama, sweet mama, why are you So that was a very beautiful song. Thank you. And I was wondering if you could uh, tell us a little bit about uh, talk. So, Appa, so a lot of this comes out of Appalachia, right? I mean, folk right. music is related to Appalachia. And you mentioned that uh, the background of this particular song. Uh, you'd worked. What is the Cecil Sharp project? So Cecil Sharp was an English folk song and dance collector. And he lived in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and he did a lot of folk song collecting in England. In fact, when um, the Church of England had shut down the singing of Christmas carols, he was one of those who lobbied to bring them back. And he came to the United States. Wait, wait, wait. Why did the Church of England so let me, why, yeah. did the, why did the Church of England shut down singing Christmas carols? That doesn't make any sense. Well, Christmas carols that were too happy for such a somber occasion as Christmas. <laughs> yeah, that sounds pretty when harsh. Did, Can when, you imagine? When, when did that happen? Um, that uh, late eighteen hundreds, very early nineteen hundreds. I mean, it's not dark and gray enough in England as it is, right? I know. <laughs> so now they can, uh, you know, they play their organs and bars and sing Christmas carols at Christmas time. It's pretty great to drink beer. <laughs> Sounds like a fun tradition. I'm wow. glad he helped bring it back. That's, that's crazy. Okay, sorry to interrupt. Oh, it's okay. Just, it kind of surprised me. <laughs> so uh, Americans asked Cecil Sharp to come into Appalachia, which is 
tip of Georgia, North Carolina, uh, Virginia, West Virginia, Kentucky, these, this mountain range, to immigrants from England, Scotland, Ireland, and other places, and to record the songs that they sang, but of course not record, um, simply write them down and document them. And so Cecil Sharp went in, he was in his 70s, he was a vegetarian, he had terrible asthma, and they would, he and his 23-year-old assistant, Maude Carpolese, on and off for three years, would walk miles every day and find people and get them to sing their songs, and he recorded over 2,000. He really wanted English folk songs about love and death. There were a lot of songs he didn't want, and so that's why the American songbook out of that region is heavily British Isles or even English songs about love and death. But I was invited to be part of the Cecil Sharp Project in England through their Folk Song and Dance Society and through the Shrewsbury Folk Festival. And seven other musicians and I, mostly from England, gathered in a farmhouse for six days and we wrote 18 songs about Cecil Sharp and his time in Appalachia. And then on the sixth day, we did a live show, and it was recorded, DVD and CD. And then we ended up touring that several times uh, in the following couple of years. It was a great experience. I really loved it. So, Caroline, I understand that uh, one of the next song we'll introduce is called uh, Black Mountain Lullaby, uh, that you wrote that uh, during this uh, Cecil Sharp project. Yes, I did. I was trying to think of subject matter because we didn't have much time and we had to write a lot of songs and some of us were the really strong musicians and a couple of us were the serious songwriters and I was one of those. And so I had read an op-ed in the New York Times by a friend of mine, Silas House, a writer from Appalachia, who had written about mountaintop removal and, and was asking why the United States was forgetting the plight of Appalachia and not taking note of the tragedies happening there. And he g gave an example of a three-year-old who died in a mountaintop removal accident. And I wrote to him and asked him about it and just started reading the newspaper accounts. And there was an actual death of a young child who was crushed uh, in his bed one night when a uh, crew on a ridge above their home accidentally pushed a thousand pound boulder over the ridge and the family settled with the uh, coal company but only under the condition they never speak publicly of his death again and so I brought this to the group and they said oh well we've got to write this song but I didn't want to exploit him I really try to dignify people I write about and it would be easy to exploit a story like that and so we made it a lullaby and we even used as the chorus a lullaby that Cecil Sharp uh, found by a mother almost silly because mothers around the world all sing lullabies to their babies but we found one that he had recorded and uh, put it as the chorus and we did this we wrote this song because it seemed important to remember the people of Appalachia not just the songs they sing, but the mouths those songs came from and their stories and and that modern day Appalachia mattered just like that other time period and then in some ways things had not changed. So before we get into the song uh, Black Mountain Lullaby, let, let's back up a little bit and uh, let's talk about what what is Appalachia. So some people might hear it as Appalachia. Yes. Right? I think northerners pronounce it Appalachia and you pronounce it Appalachia. Can you describe what region of the country of the United States we're talking about? Well, it. Uh, so I'm from the southeast and it's a sister region. So um, Tennessee, so just above the Gulf Coast in the eastern United States. So just above Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, South Carolina. So above there, Tennessee, North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, uh, Kentucky, that is all, part of that area is quite mountainous and that is where 
immigrants from the British Isles moved in and settled in the mountains and in the hollers and lived very isolated lives. That's why it was so great to go in and do song collecting because uh, they had not yet been affected and the songs were still pristine for a while. But that region was uh, taken over in great part by coal mining and still is that way today and still very much an issue economically and politically because as, that, uh, as coal mining has lessened in the region, of course, the area has become even poorer. And so uh, it's a fascinating part of the United States and it's culturally very rich and I think can argue that uh, musically it's probably more important than any other region. Uh, the, South, uh, the Southeast and Appalachia are neck and neck on the most important musical region traditionally in the U.S. I've even heard like people like the accent that people have in Appalachia are is more similar to the British colonists from 230, 40, 50, even 300 years ago than any other dialect in the United States. Have you heard that as well? Sure, and it makes sense. Mm -hmm. It makes sense and um, when people are isolated, it's a fascinating study of language and culture, but yeah, I mean there are all sorts of accents throughout Appalachia and they're similar yet different. Some hard to understand, uh, vocabulary words that are really different. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. So uh, the, the issue and the issue you talked about, mountaintop removal, can you explain? So you mentioned the coal companies took, took over the region. What yes. is mountaintop removal? Mountaintop removal is a controversial form of coal mining and it, it, it goes the way it sounds. Uh, coal companies would cut off the tops of mountains and throw them into the valley below. And it would make it easier to mine for coal because the top of the mountain was gone. But then the top of the mountain was gone. And it ruined the landscape, uh, the environment all around, the lives of the people. Um, it polluted. Uh, everything in the vicinity, water, air, otherwise, and great folk singers say like Jean Ritchie, she wrote the, the, um, the album Clean Waters Remembered, just a searing um, album about the destruction of mining and uh, mountaintop removal, but um, that's what it is and there's, there have been huge protests against it and because of that it has been on the decline. All right, well, with that uh, background, uh, we're going to uh, play the song Black Mountain Lullaby. This song is called Black Mountain Lullaby, and it's a bit about uh, mountaintop removal and um, a tragedy that occurred a few years ago near um, Appalachia, Virginia, sung in the words of the mother.
Carolina, I want to transition a little bit to your work with refugees. So you mentioned that you uh, uh, teach English as a second language uh, to a refugee center in De Decatur, Georgia. Did I say that term, the word right? Yes. Now that's my hometown, and about two miles from there is Clarkston, Georgia. Okay. And um, Clarkston, Georgia, say 15 years ago, was a suburb of Atlanta. And a lot of apartments were built there uh, because our MARTA bus line reached all the way out there and we built a new airport in Atlanta. And there were all these workers who came in, built the airport, and then left. And um, those who resettle refugees in the U.S. looked at Clarkston and said, aha, that could be a great resettlement area. And so it was made an official uh, resettlement community and it changed of course dramatically and now it the New York Times recently reported uh, that it is a square mile and that it is the most diverse square mile in the United States there are over 65 popul 65 uh, different countries represented and um, it's a wonderful place to be and I have been teaching there the past four years at uh, Refugee Family Literacy with women who are refugees and then for a short period of the day their young children ages zero to three. So we are a, a fun school to be a part of. Can you tell us a little bit about what a, what is a refugee? Well, I, mean, I, I think most most of us, I mean, I don't, it's not, I don't want to make an assumption about what, yeah. what we think we know. Well, a refugee by no fault of his own or her own has to leave, they have to leave their home for fear of violence and death and they flee and uh, try to get to a safe space and often that is a refugee camp and uh, if they're lucky uh, and it depends on which one and they live there for an extended period of time and uh, that can be a short period up to 20 years or more and refugees are hopefully resettled throughout the world. That is the hope. And yet, really, uh, very few are in comparison to the 50, 60 or more million refugees there are in the world. And for refugees going to the United States, unfortunately, the numbers have been, um, have dwindled considerably now in 2018. When I started teaching, uh, the U.S. government was was raising that number. But it is the most difficult way to get into the United States. You go through multiple interviews and a two-year process. Uh, and you and family members and distant family members and anyone who's ever come into contact with you, it, they are interviewed and interviewed again and uh, truly now, there is no more difficult way to get into the United States. And so refugees, uh, when they are approved, come in, uh, usually in the middle of the night, to whatever airport, are taken to an apartment, 
and are given resources for three months through food, through health care, through um, help with navigating the educational system and help in finding jobs and at the end of that three month period they are on their own. And uh, it's they, not very long. That is not very long. But in Clarkston, 89% of the population, at least one family member, has a job by the end of that three months. And they have four years to pay back their plane tickets that took them to the U.S. in the first place. So it's no, it's no easy journey. And uh, I uh, am amazed and grateful and really feel privileged uh, to get to know many of the students I have and I've been into the homes of Ethiopian uh, immigrants into the United States and they have five years before they can become a citizen but we encourage every refugee uh, who comes into the US to go ahead and, and get their green card and do that studying and learn as much English as they can and then to become citizens uh, after that five-year period, we want them and are glad to have them as part of the United States. I, uh, it's a great addition um, to, to, we are a diverse population. We are a nation built on immigrants and they just continue our grand tradition of, of our melting pot that is the United States. Do you have any uh, interesting, I mean, I'm sure you have a million interesting stories, but are there any uh, stories that you'd like to share with the audience about, you know, some a, a memorable refugee, you know, story arc of where someone left and why they left? And uh, Sorry, I'm not putting that well. But no, I understand think. what you mean. And I'll tell you, since I've been teaching, I've been counseled not to delve too deeply uh, mm -hmm. if, if refugees want to tell me or other teachers we have a sympathetic ear and are ready to help but I think the traumas are deep enough that um, and I don't want to be a tourist among their traumatic situations and so uh, if I uh, and, and I have uh, in hopes of getting students to write their biography or to be proud of their story um, have pushed a little bit to hear some of what they've experienced and I don't know that it's a good idea for me to even do that mm -hmm. but the stories come out and um, the they're all survivors all the women who move move in and out of our schools and um, you know one can only imagine um, parents left behind and killed siblings and so forth um, long stretches of walking, uh, long stretches without food, um, horrors witnessed, uh, and then just the slog of refugee life in a, in a camp or uh, many of our refugees in the East uh, go through Malaysia and the jobs they have to take there and you know the stories are legion there's so many stories uh, and I've I've heard just enough to um, move forward with them and I see that what they though it is obvious that every refugee who walks through our doors misses their home and would love to return there they are in the United States for a new life and it's my job to empower and equip them as best I can so that's what we do but it seems like an appropriate uh, time to talk about the next song, which is "Traveling Shoes." That's right. That's <laughs> right. Well done. Can you uh -huh. can you tell us what that sh what, the, what the next song's about? Sure. So, "Traveling Shoes" is based on a short story by Eudora Welty, who was a Mississippi writer, and it's about an elderly woman, African American woman named Phoenix Jackson, who lives out in the country uh, near Natchez, Mississippi. And Natchez is fascinating because it was a, plan, a weekend plantation town. At one point in uh, the mid-1800s, more, uh, more millionaires lived in Natchez or had homes in Natchez than any other place in the United States. I know that sounds crazy, but um, there were plantations on the opposite side of the Mississippi River in Louisiana 
and the plantation owners would take boats back across the river maybe at the end of the week and live with their families in these amazing townhomes is the wrong word they're antebellum homes so what, what, yeah, so let's uh, back up. So what is a plantation and what does antebellum mean? All right. So antebellum is before the Civil War, the antebellum period. And um, plantations uh, were built throughout the Southeast. And uh, through plantations, um, people in the Southeast uh, had a very lucrative agricultural uh, how to say it exactly, let's see. Um, so as people in the United States brought in slaves, millions of slaves from Africa and the Caribbean, uh, many of those slaves went to plantations throughout the Southeast. Plantation owners who grew cotton and rice and other crops. And their homes were called plantations uh, plantation homes and then the big farm around it was called the plantation so really a fiefdom a small mm -hmm. kingdom and the antebellum period was pre-civil war so when those uh, when the plantation culture thrived that was the antebellum period and so many plantation owners lived in Natchez Mississippi and built weekend homes there plantation homes for their families and Phoenix Jackson was the elderly African-American woman who lived outside of Natchez. And she couldn't bend her knees, she couldn't walk well. Uh, she was very elderly, but she needed to get medicine for her young grandson. And whenever they ran out of medicine, she would take the worn path into Natchez. And the short story is called A Worn Path. And so Phoenix Jackson walked into Natchez very slowly, very deliberately, and it was Christmas time, and she saw all the de decorations and the lights, and she was really enamored of the beauty of those decorations and of, obviously, the splendor of the town. And she was also quite sad because she had no money um, with which to buy her grandson a Christmas gift. And then she realizes her shoe is untied, and there's no way that she can bend down to tie it, and yet she's got to keep walking to the doctor's office to get the medicine. And so she stops a white woman and says, can you please help me? And the lady says, what? What is it, Grandma? And she said, can you please tie my shoe? And so that's what the song is based on. Phoenix Jackson's traveling shoes It's very difficult. Um, and nothing stops her. All right. Well, here's Caroline Herring's Traveling Shoes. This next song is called Traveling Shoes, and it's based on your Dorwelty's short story, A Worn Path. Tie my traveling shoes. Tie my traveling shoes. Tie my traveling shoes, give me something I can use Won't you tie my traveling shoes? Shadow of the pine In the shadow of the pine In the shadow of the pine Phoenix sways from side to side In the shadow of the pine Tie my traveling shoes Tie my traveling shoes Tie my traveling shoes Give me something I can use Won't you tie my traveling shoes Lady, won't you please Kind lady, won't you please Lady, won't you please go down upon your knees, kind lady, won't you please? And tie my traveling shoes, tie my traveling shoes, tie my traveling shoes, give me something I can use, won't you tie my traveling shoes? Ease down slow 
Won't you ease down slow? Ease down slow. Got so many miles to go. Won't you ease down slow? And tie my traveling shoes. Tie my traveling shoes. Tie my traveling shoes. Give me something I can use. Won't you tie my traveling shoes? Welcome back, um, so Caroline. Uh, as we close out, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your visit here in Ethiopia. So, how how long have you been in town? Almost a week. Almost a week. So, can you tell us a little bit about what you've done in the week that you've been here? Sure. Um, I have led workshops and done concerts at three schools so far, uh, high school and middle schools, um, public, Catholic, Yemeni schools, and I've talked about learning English through music. And that's pretty easy because I feel like English is like music in a way. It goes up and down like waves do. You cannot talk in a monotone uh, sort of way and be understood as effectively and so <laughs> you, you can you just well, nobody will listen to nobody you. <laughs> nobody will know what you're saying and obviously what was the movie the Bueller there was a teacher yes there was, there was a famous movie in the 80s called Ferris Bueller's Day Off and they had a teacher who talked like this the whole time and it panned the audience of the, the classroom and people were like <laughs> <laughs> their mouths open and like falling that's, asleep and, that's it you know, yeah that's it. And so um, I talk about um, the, uh, the sound bites of uh, the, the importance of syllables and the accent on syllables in, in the English language. And that's perfectly done through music, especially when I sing songs that don't have too many words. And because of my southern accent, I think I have a bit of extra music, which they can hear. <laughs> and so... Um, those have really been a lot of fun, and I found students shy at first, and then ju the questions just won't stop at the end. So I've loved that, and then I've. How, so does, it, how does your training? So how does it, how does the class go? So can you describe like how how do you teach English through music in a classroom setting? Well, for these um, presentations at the schools, I lay out about five of my songs, and I teach around those five, and talk about the importance of stories. Uh, in learning language, anything to to make it more interesting, anything to go beyond uh, worksheets and verb tenses, um, the, the importance of repetition, uh, the importance of building on knowledge already gained to build confidence, and then simply what I do. And uh, a few songs that I felt like students could understand and their vocabulary could take in what I was saying and so I would break songs down, do some explanations and you know at the end of it I think um, those workshops and presentations are helpful only in that they're they're interesting and it's a different way to learn and uh, that's inspiring to people. So it's, it's easy to get um, so tired, bogged down in language and uh, even better if you can get up on your feet and do something. Mm -hmm. but um, So I did a, a two-hour songwriting workshop at um, uh, uh, NALA, yeah. uh, American uh, NALA, and worked with American Spaces both there and through the internet. Uh, they were all apart and we broke down uh, six songs in a very different way for adult songwriters. And then I'll be working with refugee students this afternoon and doing a concert later today and we'll be very involved with World Refugee Day in Addis Ababa tomorrow and then on Thursday I will go to refugee camps in the Asosa region and working with refugees and musicians at those camps. So it is really a marvelous and super fun experience for me. I'm having a great time. So by the time this airs, it'll be Thursday. So tomorrow, which is Wednesday, yeah. is World Refugee Day. That's right. Uh, what, what do you, uh, what can you describe what the commemorations are going to be like? Do you? 
Well, to be honest, I'm not really sure of all of it. Mm -hmm. At this point, I know on my schedule I am to be there. But I think that refugees, I know there's a big transit center here, and I think um, there'll be many people from that center involved. I know uh, perhaps from different, some of the many different refugee camps in Ethiopia, I know there'll be dancers and musicians and artists and presentations of all types. So I think just recognizing and dignifying the plight of refugees in Ethiopia and the world, that's what it's all about. Just for the record, so uh, Wednesday the African Union is also holding a meeting about uh, about refugees, so uh, everyone is thinking about it. Um, I was wondering if you, have you ever uh, uh, worked with, uh, I'm sure you've been to a refugee camp before. Never. Never, so this would be your first time. It will. Okay, interesting. interesting. Yes. All right. Very good. Um, so, uh, look, uh, unfortunately, we have to start closing down. Uh, we've got one final song that we're going to gonna close with, a song called Fireflies. So can you tell us a little bit about this song? So another word for fireflies is lightning bugs. And it looks like a mosquito, and all of a sudden it's got a little light bulb on its back. And you see them in your backyard or in the park and at night at certain times of year. There will be tons of them in the air, and it's really beautiful to see. And uh, as a child, we would always catch fireflies in mason jars, jars with a top, and watch them for a while and then hopefully let them go. Now this story... You, you You let yours go, well, you know, <laughs> officially, yes, of course. I, I, um, my, I, I, I would catch them, so I grew up, they, they, we had them in Ohio as well. And like yeah. about to, around July, they come out, and like they're only out for about a week, right? I think in, in Ohio. And, you know, it was always a special time to go out and catch them. And then, you know, I keep them in the, my bedroom. And of course, you know, my mom's, they're, they're going to die overnight. It's like you never. No way. You're too smart for your parents, right? No way. You know? I know. But I put grass in there, and like all these, like oh, man, yeah, they're all gone the next day. But Sadness. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Oh no, that's all right. So yeah, the song is called Fireflies. Well, Caroline, uh, as we uh, we're going to close out with that, uh, anything uh, that you'd like to share with us that we didn't touch on today? No, not really. It's been a great pleasure to be a guest on your show and. Best wishes to you, and thanks for having me. All right, we've been uh, we've been listening and speaking with Caroline Herring, uh, who's a uh, internationally acclaimed American singer songwriter and uh, English as a second language teacher. Caroline, thank you for uh, coming to Real Talk USA. Thank you. All right, we're this. Uh, you're about to listen to Fireflies. Hey
Real Talk USA. It's my house, come on, turn it up. The hour where the U.S. mission to the African Union comes to you through Afro FM 105.3 to highlight the United States partnership in Africa. Current issues will be discussed. Guests will engage on a variety of topics ranging from politics to jazz. Co-hosted by AUL Salomon of Afro FM and Chris Mead of USAU. The show will air every Thursday from 5 to 6 p.m. Feel free to participate by sending messages to the USAU social media sites www.usau.usmission.gov or www.facebook.com forward slash USAU and follow USAU on twitter.com forward slash USAU Real Talk USA It's my house <laughs>